Good afternoon. I'm very pleased to welcome His Excellency, the Ambassador of Switzerland. Francois Barras is, uh, is a special ambassador. Now, every ambassador is a special ambassador. But he is especially <laughs> special <laughs> for three reasons. One is that he's ambassador in Lebanon for the second time. That's most uncommon. And, uh, and unless you really have a valuable contribution to make, you're not asked to go back to the country that you've served before. And unless you are attached to the country that you've served before, you won't accept the offer to come again. So in that sense, he is very special. He's also special as an ambassador who thinks constantly about the profession. As, and as you know, uh, it's a profession that, is, that has to be reinvented almost every morning. Uh, diplomats are not what they used to be. Uh, of course, they, are, uh, they all have <laughs> old habits, they send code cables, but they have every morning to, to think of new ways in, uh, in getting on with their job. Public diplomacy is, uh, is a recent role that, uh, that many ambassadors are called to perform. And they have to be innovative. And I can, I can assure you that Francois is extremely innovative the way he has been working as a bridge builder between Switzerland and Lebanon. So he invents his profession, reinvents it, but also thinks about it so much that he had been asked by New York University to teach a course on uh, this changing profession. Uh, he, uh, while in New York, he, he gave courses, and uh, he also lectured at the Abu Dhabi branch of New York University um, on the same topic. And I thought it would be beneficial to all of us to hear from him what kind of diplomat does the modern world in which we live need, what roles, how do diplomats get prepared to those new roles? But I leave it to him, not only to give, to give his lecture, and he said it won't be a very long lecture, but more importantly, to exchange with, with you views about uh, how diplomacy changes in this profession, the world of today. Thank you, Tarek. Good afternoon. First of all, uh, I would like to thank the Isam Faris Institute for uh, um, the kind invitation. I have been lucky to, to know uh, Tarek Mitri for a long time during my first mission in Lebanon and to, to work very closely with him in uh, rather difficult and special circumstances. And uh, I, uh, I met also several times in New York as a former director, Rami Khouri. So I am in a, bit, in a way a bit familiar with the Isam Fares Institute. So uh, the title of my presentation is a bit pompous. I, I'm sorry, that's the title I used in Abu Dhabi when I gave um, a lecture last March on uh, the course I gave at NYU. Why? Uh, a diplomat would give a course in a, at a university. This is maybe already one kind of answer to the new role of, uh, of diplomats in the 21st century. In my case, it happened very simply. Um, new York University was founded nearly two centuries ago by a Swiss, Albert Galata, who was a second uh, secretary of the Treasury, American secretary of the Treasury. He came from Geneva. And we were celebrating, I think, the 200th anniversary of his birth or something like that. And I was seated next to President Sexton. John Sexton is the president of NYU and at a dinner. And uh, as you may know, NYU has three campuses, one in New York, one in Abu Dhabi, and one in Shanghai. So at the end of the dinner, John told me, would you like to give a course at NYU? 
I said, I never gave a course in my life. I have no idea, you know, but uh, he said, no, you know, I think you, uh, you can choose the topic. You can do whatever you like, uh, and uh, it will be part of the President Honors Program. This is America, you know, very different from, from Switzerland and Europe, you know, in <laughs> the way they, they, do, they, do, they do things. So I thought it over, and I felt it would be a good, uh, a good exercise for me and a good exercise in public diplomacy because my job, I was Consul General of Switzerland in New York, and my job then was mainly, I, I was calling myself a marketing director of Brand Switzerland in New York. So part of my branding activity was uh, to increase, to develop contacts with universities. So I said, okay, why not a course? So uh, I had to choose a topic, and uh, the idea came from the living room of my residence. You see, I, I, I was lucky in New York to have a beautiful penthouse apartment, a, resi a beautiful residence, and with this huge living room, um, pre-war, what they call pre-war building, built in the beginning of the 20, 20th century, and Suddenly I said, what has this living room to do with my job as marketing director of Brand Switzerland in New York? And in fact, not much, you know, because uh, you imagine in such a living room, you imagine three diplomats uh, smoking cigars, drinking whiskey, and uh, I don't know, managing the affairs of the world, you know, in a very closed atmosphere. And my job was to give five, six, seven presentations a week, to go, to be always on the road, to speak to young people. So I, I, I felt there was a, a great discrepancy between this beautiful residence and my actual job. And it gave me the idea, I said, okay, I, I, we should maybe uh, uh, think about uh, developing a course or exploring with my students what is the impact of the changes in the last 30 years on the profession of diplomat. So changes, you know, I entered the, the diplomatic service in 1986, nearly 30 years ago, and that was before the fall of the Berlin Wall. Now in between you have had the globalization, you have so many new actors active in, uh, in international relations, you have what we call instant communication, that means before uh, a diplomat he hears about uh, some news already, the whole world knows about it. Then you have uh, the information technology, which has transformed a lot, you know, our, our profession with uh, all, those, all the social media and the new ways to communicate. And finally, you have more and more, I would say, new threats, and those threats are globalized threats. You know, you cannot just uh, work as, as a country to find a solution to um, climate change or to other or, or the, or the, or the global, global threats. So I, I thought it would be a good idea to, uh, to explore that with my students. So I developed a 15 session seminar, um, three hours every Monday morning, and I gave it several times. So it was, I have to say, a, a big job because to, to develop a, a syllabus, you know, and to write, to uh, give to the students every week Readings. You have to read the readings, you know, in order to. <laughs> so it was a whole summer, but uh, I, I don't regret it because it was a, a wonderful a learning experience for me. Also, I invited a lot of people, and for I remember, I still remember, I invited uh, your uh, your ambassador at the United Nations, Nawaf Salam, to talk to my students and a lot of other people. So it has been a, a really a wonderful, a wonderful experience. I had a seminar with around 20 students coming from. 12, 13, 15 different countries. It was um, um, really uh, um, great. So what I will do, very, I will do a kind of synthesis of, of my course, very brief, and then we, we will be able to discuss about it. So first of all, I will say a few words about the changes I, I just mentioned. Then I will explain how these changes have impacted on the various activity functions of, of a diplomat. And finally, I will try to give you some idea about what I think are the main qualities of a diplomat in the 21st century. I am really speaking of the bilateral diplomat. That means the diplomat who is, who is uh, uh, posted in a country, and it's a, really a different ballgame as multilateral diplomacy, 
and also as um, negotiations, but we'll, we'll, uh, we'll tackle that afterwards. So let me say a few words about the changes in the last, uh, in the last 30 years. The first change is that you have seen, you have uh, observed a relativization of state sovereignty. Um, traditionally, state sovere you know, uh, states had the control over sovereignty, and diplomats were really representatives of that state. It was a kind of exclusive sovereignty. Now, with the growing importance of uh, international law, uh, which is a kind of framework for international relations, with, um, you know, I would say today, money and technology are as important as, or is sometimes more important as uh, state sovereignty in international relations. And uh, you also have uh, 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 many, many challenges which cannot be solved only thinking about, about uh, um, a state sovereignty. So what you see is a relativization of, uh, of the state sovereignty, and it is accompanied by many, many new actors in international relations. Before, the state was the main actor. Now you have so many different, uh, uh, um, different actors. Even at the, I would say, at the official level, you have many supranational organizations. Think about in Europe, about the European Union, but not speaking about the UN. Uh, at the infra-state level, you have regions which become more and more important, and even cities. In New York, for example, when I was in New York, uh, there was a league of cities, and uh, mayors were met regularly to uh, discuss about common challenges, and uh, they were totally independent from the state, and uh, um, often they said that this global league of mayors was more efficient than uh, interstate relations. Then you have a lot of non-governmental new actors, so many NGOs are active in international relations, but the ancestor of all the, uh, these NGOs is maybe the, the Red Cross, but now you have uh, so many Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, but you know, you know all of them. You have international companies, which really um, become also active in international relations. For example, Google has, has created a think tank to, to, to contribute to solutions of, of uh, world challenges. Then you have famous individuals, think about uh, President Clinton with his global initiative, think about uh, President Carter as a peacemaker, think about even stars, George Clooney, you know, in Sudan. So everyone wants to do international relations and wants to uh, better the state of the world. So the diplomat is a bit, you know, lost among all these, uh, among all these, uh, these new, new actors. Also, churches, universities, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a trend, it's a trend. Then another thing has really changed a lot. It is the development of what we call symmetry and direct contacts among politicians, heads of state, prime ministers. Traditionally, the diplomat was uh, the representative of a state in another state. Today, you have two ministers, they take the phone, they talk on the phone, they solve a problem, and if the, the ambassador is informed, he is lucky. So, <laughs> so, you know, you are in a situation where, you know, you, you just sometimes you just wonder what, what, is, what is my role? What is my role in this world where you have? And then these heads of state and prime ministers meet on a monthly basis in international conferences, in summits, in, you know, and so uh, this has really... I would say, uh, changed, uh, changed a lot. Then, instant communication. Instant communication, it's, you know, diplomats like to say that the worst enemy of a diplomat is CNN. Because CNN, you know, uh, you have um, I don't know, a development in a country, it goes uh, on TV, and before you know it, your ministry calls you and tells you, but what is this, please, uh, we need a reaction, what do we do, what, uh, so uh, it has changed completely before you were really the person who um, really informed your, your, um, your government, your ministry about things now, um, sometimes you, you, follow, you, follow, you follow things, and also it, it has changed 
the relationship between the diplomats and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, because there is a constant, you know, uh, um, constant request from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to take a stand, to uh, make a new, uh, um, a new inquiry, etc., because of this instant communication. Then another big change is what well, naturally the IT revolution. Because now uh, um, uh, all the new ways to communicate have, have uh, transformed the way we communicate, has transformed the way we, we also we communicate to the public, um, Facebook, Twitter, all kinds of new ways to, to, to communicate. And uh, uh, you are constantly asked to present the position of, of, of your country through all these um, through all these uh, this, this new ways to, to, to communicate. And the last thing is, I would say there is an increased specialization. Traditionally, the ambassador or the diplomat was a generalist, and he was able to manage the relations between his country and, his con and the country of residence. Today, you have so many special specialization. You know, the tax people are really tax specialists, um, uh, civil aviation specialists, uh, environment specialists. So, uh, the ambassador, the generalist, the diplomat as generalist also uh, has to ask himself, what is my role in, uh, in, uh, in this new world where specialization is so, uh, is, is, so, is so important? So, many, many changes which have naturally impacted on um, our, daily, our daily life, you see, our daily life. So now I will say a few words about what are the main daily activities of diplomats in, in today's world. You know, traditionally, uh, a, a diplomat, and it still is valid for now, we, our main job is to defend and to promote the interest of our country. This is it. Defend and promote the interest of our, our country. And so you have different ways to, 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 doing, to do that. And the first, I would say there are a few traditional uh, uh, roles or traditional tasks and a few more modern task. Among the traditional tasks, you have representation, which is uh, the first, one of the first tasks. Then you have reporting, reaching out to the authorities, negotiating, mediating, and then you have some new, new tasks. So the first task I, I went to, to, to tackle is representation. So this has been, I would say, a traditional task of, of diplomats. A diplomat represents its country in another country. It's, you know, we are a function. We are, you know, uh, and, and in that function, 80%, uh, uh, one of the guests, of my, uh, of the guests at my, uh, one of my uh, courses, an American ambassador said, 80% of the job of a diplomat is showing up. So uh, sometimes you, you, you know, I, I, uh, I have myself every evening three to five different functions. You know. And uh, often after the third, I said, no, go home. You know, I don't know what is the you because, and every time you make this, that, this little extra effort and often it's rewarded because when you, you, you represent your country, first of all, you represent your country, but then you have this opportunity to meet people to, and this is one of the basic, I would say, uh, qualities of a diplomat is this curiosity and this ability to build, to build networks to defend uh, one's country. So representation has been traditionally very important and remains something very important. I was t telling you about the embassy, you know. Why, you, you would ask, why uh, countries need this large and impressive embassies? Because, you know, basically an embassy uh, uh, is the symbol of the power of a country. And uh, one good example are, you know, often the most beautiful embassies in the world are the French embassies, the French embassies, you know, like here, Residence des Pins, etc. And they really are, uh, uh, I would say, uh, yeah, the symbol of French power as it was, uh, it was, uh, it was, uh, it was once. So, uh, in representation, protocol is very important. I don't want to go into protocol affairs, but protocol basically is just a technique to 
who manage this representation um, task, this representation activity. The second very important task is reporting because your, uh, your country, your ministry expects you to report on what happens in your country of residence in order to shape policy because ideally your reports should um, help shape policy towards country X or Y or Z. So as I said, in this world, we, 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 we are now, we have an overflow of information. That means too much information. So the, the, the way to report has changed a lot in the last uh, 20 years. Before you were reporting on what happened in a country and you did a little analysis afterwards. Today, each ministry is completely uh, invaded by, by all kinds of information from you know, morning to night, etc. And your job is much more to uh, analyze, to uh, make uh, a selection of the information, to tell them what information is relevant, and to try to uh, give some clarity to this overflow of information about a about, uh, situation. So it, it's not so much transmission of information as it was one, uh, once was. It's more how to, to, to think uh, um, this information, how to transform, I would say, information in some useful knowledge for, you, for your ministry. So it's a, it's a very different way to, to, uh, to, uh, um, to, do, thing, to do things. Um, what else, you know, about reporting? I, I would say, well, that, that's it, you know. Then another important task is naturally, daily task is reaching out to the authorities. And this has remained more or less the same. You have a technique, you know, you have this not diplomatic and the démarche and you go, you visit, for example, I have been here now for two months. I am in the middle of my tour to all the ministries. 24 ministers, so I have to, to, to make courtesy calls. So you spend a lot of time uh, reaching to, uh, to the government. And then, you know, uh, this, this job of reaching to the government can take uh, special, um, uh, uh, special ways if you want to, to really signal something to, uh, uh, to, the, to the government of, of your country of residence. Then you can uh, by doing several things, you can signal either that you are saying something you s that um, you agree with uh, a policy of the government, that you don't agree with a policy of the government, that you uh, would like a change, that you um, warn a government. So this is also a diplomatic technique which is as old as diplomacy, it's called diplomatic, uh, diplomatic signaling. What we also do when reaching with, with government is another form of diplomacy called transformal diplomacy. It's not so much what, uh, what Switzerland does, but some countries, you know, but we try to promote democracy, to promote human rights, but some countries do it very aggressively and uh, they make uh, a lobbying work to uh, uh, promote democracy, to promote human rights, or to promote um, other, uh, other issue. So this is our, I would say, our uh, uh, daily, our daily uh, interaction with the government. Often what we do, we also uh, uh, went to have uh, an agreement with the government about uh, some international issues. So uh, for example, uh, we, we do very often this, uh, uh, this agreement about nominating someone to, uh, uh, to into an international organization. So we try to find, uh, to make deals between governments about, you know, I support uh, your candidate to one organization, you support our candidate to one organization. And this comes to another very important activity of, uh, of, of, of diplomats, it's negotiation and mediation. Bilateral diplomats like myself, we are not normally on the forefront of negotiations. Negotiations are done by specialists and we are more there to say around the angles and 
com compared to specialists, let's say you start a tax negotiation between Lebanon and Switzerland, you will have tax specialists coming to discuss with your tax specialist, but the, the bilateral diplomat, which um, is posted in Lebanon, has the overall view of the bilateral relations between his country and Lebanon. So in this negotiation, we can give our input by saying, okay, we have a problem to reach a negotiation in this uh, specific uh, topic, but we know that Lebanon needs something in another area. And so we can, because we have the full picture, be of, uh, of, uh, of, of, great, uh, of great help. But generally speaking, negotiation is basically left to, to specialists. And I don't even speak about peace negotiation, which is still another, uh, another, another issue. Uh, in my ministry, we have people who are specialized in, uh, in peace negotiation. It happens that the bilateral ambassador is involved in those peace negotiations, but um, normally they are, they are, they are um, specialists. And in the case of Switzerland, we have a long tradition of mediation. That means when two countries uh, don't speak to each other, we try to come in and to help people uh, start to, uh, to, to, speak, uh, to, to speak to each other. So this is basically what we do when we deal with another state. Then uh, there are some new, I would say, some uh, relatively new tasks. I would briefly mention uh, what I call service, servicing and crisis management. One of our main tasks is naturally to take good care of our citizens in, 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 in the country of residence. That means uh, uh, we uh, have a consular section where people can come and renew their passes, and um, when they marry, when, when uh, you know, do everything which has, uh, has to do with uh, civil status. But also, we, uh, it becomes more and more important to give a good service to one citizen and especially in crisis situations. And Lebanon has, has lived some crisis situation, and my experience has been very simple. When there is no crisis, media have no interest in diplomacy, or very little, except it's this high peacemaking diplomacy. But in the daily work of an embassy, you never see a journalist, you never see. As soon as there is a crisis, immediately, you have plenty of people coming, asking questions, and they are waiting for the slightest mistake of the diplomats, especially in taking good care of one's citizen. So uh, um, we are always told, be very careful about give, giving a good service to your citizens. Because uh, now, more and more, you have what is called accountability. Uh, um, an embassy, diplomats, you know, uh, it, it costs a lot of money to the taxpayers. And uh, the taxpayers, the parliaments, they want to have a return on investment. And the first return on investment is really to take good care of one's citizens. So uh, uh, this is what I call uh, servicing and, 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 uh, and crisis management. So we are now trained in crisis management much more. And I have to say that, uh, unfortunately, there are more and more countries where you have crisis. So crisis management has become one of, uh, uh, I would say, of our main, our main tasks. And then uh, another thing which has changed a lot in the last 30 years is management. Before, traditionally, we used to be bureaucrats. That means it was a very centralized system. You would uh, receive instruction from the capital and then just uh, apply, you know, um, apply the instruction. Now, most embassies are uh, self-sufficient, uh, small, I would say, uh, not companies because uh, it's public, but we are managed like, uh, like a small company. That means we receive a certain amount at every year to uh, get the embassy functioning, but we are responsible of how to use the money, what to do, and then they are just uh, uh, controlled. So we really have to develop our management skills compared to, to 30 years ago. 
and uh, it's, it's quite important, management skill and control skills. You know, we have to, we do a lot of training in risk management and, and risk assessment. And uh, so we have become, in a way, I would say, uh, uh, yeah, CEOs of, uh, of, uh, of, of a small company, which is a very different role as what we did 30 years ago. And then the main change, the main change is what uh, um, Tarek was, was uh, referring to, what we call public diplomacy. Public diplomacy, because uh, traditionally we were you know, representative to a state. And we rarely went out of the embassy. I give you as an example, in the 50s, a British ambassador to Paris, I think he was there for three years, and he gave two public speeches in three years. So uh, uh, it's really a, a huge change. As I said, in New York, I was, I was uh, uh, very, very often, uh, very often out. And uh, the motto today for an ambassador is to be visible, not only uh, uh, to represent one's country, but to uh, interact with as many uh, actors in the country. That means not only government, parliament, uh, uh, administration, but universities, think tanks, uh, civil society, and uh, uh, our, our, our main job, or one of our main job, is to make uh, understandable the policies of our country, to win friends, to create networks, in order to uh, uh, better promote our country. And this is, uh, in a way, a very, a very uh, um, a new, new role. So there are all kinds of, uh, of instruments. I was telling you about social media. Or in, in this country, you have my, for example, my British colleague, he has a blog, and uh, he's, uh, he's quite famous, thanks to his, uh, to his, to his blog. But in, uh, we, are, we will now uh, start a Facebook page at the embassy. In, in New York, I, I was quite active in, on Twitter, on Facebook, and uh, many people don't really understand because public diplomacy, there is a kind of contradiction in term because diplomacy is in a way secret and, and you do public, but it's, it's a different ball game. You know, here we are really uh, uh, trying to uh, do uh, diplomacy of influence you know, by making our countries and our country's policies better known we are winning friends. We are winning friends. So uh, uh, face, for example, my Facebook experience in New York was very positive because many people had the idea that at the consulate general you only go to uh, renew your passport or to get a visa. But they had no idea of all the services of, uh, of, uh, of Swiss representation. Thanks to Facebook, we built a lot of, uh, of um, networks, especially with young people. And uh, um, we, we started new projects and it was a very, you know, it gave because my main priority in New York was to show how Switzerland was a country fully uh, uh, rooted in the 21st century, a very contemporary country, modern country, uh, also uh, um, uh, we, a country which is part of the discussion on how to find solution to challenges, to, to contemporary challenges, etc. And Facebook and, and Twitter were uh, really excellent, uh, excellent ways to, uh, to do that. So what we do through public diplomacy is much more than uh, propaganda or than advertising. It's, it's really trying to build with a country of residence a long-term uh, relationship. A trust, a, a trust relationship. And many, many countries do now nation branding. You know, nation branding has become uh, something quite, uh, quite important. And then there is naturally lobbying. Lobbying is a bit different because lobbying, you, you, you lobby for a certain, certain objective, a, a focused objective. I give you an example. Uh, the Swedish ambassador in Switzerland, we, uh, Switzerland wanted to, build, to, to buy planes from Sweden and, and from France. There was different choices. And we vote on everything in Switzerland. So we had to vote on the buying of these planes. And these um, uh, this Swedish ambassadors, in order to win the trust of the Swiss, had developed a whole array of, uh, of activities. 
uh, mainly cultural, but uh, also commercial, in order to, the, for the Swiss to, to, to trust the Swedes. Unfortunately for him, for me, he did a very good job. That's exactly what I would have done. But uh, his plan was leaked to the press, and the press treated that as um, an invasion of, uh, of, of Switzerland by, you know, a kind of... Uh, uh, he was accused by politicians of having gone beyond... His, uh, his work as uh, as diplomats. So uh, as diplomats. So uh, that's just uh, an example. And when you do lobbying, you often, if especially if you have a, a, a politically hot topic, it may become dangerous. You know, we did not talk about uh, uh, the leaks because you know, with uh, uh, one big issue in the last years was this WikiLeaks. You know. And uh, it's not so much about public diplomacy, but it's more about, uh, uh, I would say, about reports, <coughs> confidential reports, which got telegrams, which got, uh, which got leaked, you know. But then uh, um, this has, has uh, caused many, many problems to the, to the US especially, and uh, uh, because <coughs> our job as diplomats as I told you, is to defend our country. So what the Swedish ambassador did, or for example, I remember, speaking of WikiLeaks, the, the US ambassadors to Mexico. He was, in his, in his uh, report to his capital, quite critical of the Mexican government because he was saying that the Mexican, especially at the president level, was not cooperative enough in drug deal, in drug uh, uh, um, trafficking fight, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And all this was leaked. He lost immediately the confidence of the president, and he had to, to retire. He had to, to, to leave his post. So uh, what I want to say in all this task we, 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 we do, what is most important is trust. Basically, uh, a good diplomat builds trust. So now a few words about what are the qualities of a good diplomat in the 21st century. For what, from what I said, you can already guess. I would say the first quality, which has always been a quality for a diplomat, but uh, it's curiosity. You have a, a diplomat as to be uh, curious, curious about the country serving in, curious about what goes on, always observing, always trying to, to, uh, to bring the best of, of, of his, his uh, uh, bring out the best of his daily experiences. The second quality, I would say, it's communication skills. Much more, you know, than, than, than 30 years ago. Communication skills, how to communicate, how to, I, I would say, uh, an extrovert diplomat is a plus because uh, you are paid to meet people, you are paid to, to, to know people. If you are afraid of your own shadow, it's not the right profession. Although some, you know, uh, in some parts of diplomacy, maybe uh, it's not necessarily uh, useful, but in general, in, in public diplomacy and, and in bilateral diplomacy, this, uh, um, this openness is, is very important. And the third quality is flexibility because uh, it's, a, it's a profession where you change countries every four years, you change colleagues every year, you change you know, environment. If you are not flexible, it's, uh, it's, not, uh, it's, it's not so easy to be, to be, uh, to be, a, to be a diplomat. So uh, there are many, as I, I told you, there are different ball games, you know. What I was, the qualities I gave you are mainly for bilateral diplomacy. For multilateral diplomacy, it's another ball game. It's very different, you know. Bilateral diplomacy, ideally, ideally, I say, is a love story with a country. You arrive in a country, it's a blank sheet, and then you start to write, defending your country, defending your, your you know, but you try to write your story with country X or Z. Uh, it's... It's a much more, much, uh, I would say, deeper knowledge. It's something which uh, uh, is totally different. Multilateral diplomacy, you are in the conference room and you negotiate a text. You, 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 you learn how to make agreements, to make deals with other countries, and you have to have a panoramic view of 
all what happens in uh, in in uh, in a particular conference or among many many countries. So it's a different game. Uh, also, bilateral diplomacy and negotiate negotiation is very different. The qualities I, I I was talking about are good for bilateral diplomacy. Negotiating is something very different. Negotiating is much more about tactics, about uh, knowing uh, knowing the other, about uh, uh, procedure, about you know it's. So, oh, for example, a good negotiator does not really need to be a good communicator. Because not, it does not have to have the same, uh, uh, the same, the same qualities. Uh, what? Forget something. So, uh, uh, one quality I feel is very, very important is there is a wonderful English word called serendipity. Serendipity is for me, uh, it's uh, in French we say le heureux hasard. That means you, uh, you know, I think it was uh, about the discovery of Sri Lanka, of Ceylon. Someone was sailing and by chance he discovered Ceylon, which was called Serendab, and he discovered all the wealth of Ceylon. So it is really to always, in any, in any encounter you have, anything you do, just try to identify what the opportunity, the opportunity, le, le heureux hasard. And I, I would say that's a very important, very, very important quality of, of the diplomacy. To, to conclude, I would say that bilateral diplomacy in the 21st century remains, you know, the, the basic, the basic uh, objectives are exactly the same as 3,000 years ago or 4,000 years ago. And your country, promote your interest. Instruments have become different, and especially now, it has become much more complex, much more open. It remains, for me, uh, a technique, but the big difference between, you know, uh, let's say, I like sometimes to make a very funny comparison between a heart surgeon and a diplomat. A heart surgeon, 98% of what you ask from a heart surgeon is a technique. It can be friendly, not friendly, it can speak, not speak, you know, if he operates well, it's good. With a diplomat, I would say the technique is maybe a quarter, and or 40%, 60% is the personality, the person, the way you, 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 uh, uh, you the way you act. It's a, so uh, it's a great, you know, uh, profession because you, you can really you set the tune, you know, you set the tune by the way you act, you interact with people. And what is very interesting and very nice with, with uh, diplomacy, it's a fashion, but it's also a way of life. It's an art of, of, of life. You, you grow up with each posting. You, you, do, you grow up and you grow up with a country and, and it's, a, it's an ongoing learn, learning process. And what is interesting is that you find many diplomats who are also good writers. I think I, I identify five Nobel Prizes who were diplomats. Because you, being a diplomat, being an observer in a country, in a society which is foreign to you, makes you also a very good, uh, I would say, observer and, and, and writer. And it's interesting to see how many, how many diplomats, you know, uh, Developed uh, uh, writing skills. Writing skills. So I think I already spoke too much. I'm sorry. I could have gone longer, you know, because it's, uh, it's really a synthesis. But uh, I, I welcome your question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, your last remark about uh, about writing. I, from the little I know about diplomatic code cable, I see a tendency now to write better code cables than in the past because those who receive them already are aware of what is happening in the world. So the literary value of what you're writing is far more important than the factual kind of character Absolutely. that that previous code cables had. I, I recently I recently uh, read a code cable sent by an ambassador 
in Tajikistan yeah, who attended a wedding. And he wrote like 10 pages about the wedding, but it was 10 pages about Tajikistan. And, and, uh, but you, have, you have to have time to read the 10 pages. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the floor is yours for yeah. comments, questions. Ambassador Khouri. Um, I'm actually uh, here. Uh, um, as a former ambassador, out of nostalgia, <laughs> because uh, I left the career about 10 years ago. And uh, I just want to say that uh, I'm very pleased to see again uh, my good friend uh, Francois Barras here as ambassador of Switzerland. <clears throat> um, just to give you an idea of my experience as ambassador of Lebanon in Tokyo for nine and a half years, it was actually during the war, I was the ambassador but also the consul and on occasions the accountant. So I, I was wearing many hats and I, for those nine and a half years, I had no one to assist me as a diplomat. I had local staff. But uh, we managed to help. And uh, we even represented Lebanon in Taiwan, which had no Lebanese representative as a consul, of course. And we received uh, formalities and passports to renew from Taiwan. So it was actually quite uh, uh, an experience and very interesting nine years in Tokyo. Well, what I would like to ask you, Ambassador uh, Balas, um, in Lebanon, um, is there anything specific about this country in terms of how you deal with it as a diplomat, as an ambassador? Well, I would say that uh, Lebanon is extremely, for an ambassador, extremely uh, interesting and rich because you have basically all uh, uh, the dimensions of, of diplomacy. You have uh, uh, humanitarian work, which is uh, uh, important in this country, but it's much more than humanitarian. You know, so sometimes I, I see uh, uh, some of my colleagues, because among nations, you know, you have humanitarian spe specialists, and so people are um, posted in uh, Afghanistan, in uh, Kosovo, etc. And they come to Lebanon, with this specialty, and they, they, found a very, they find a very different country because you have the humanitarian dimension, but you have also, uh, uh, um, I, would not, I would not say that Lebanon itself is a strong economy, but it's a platform for, a fantastic platform in the field of economy, in the field of, uh, of uh, uh, politics. You know, it's an extremely interesting country, and especially coming from Switzerland, uh, you know, you have this old cliché about uh, Switzerland and Lebanon, which was invented by the Lamartine when he saw the mountains and the work. But it's much more than a cliché, because in the mind of Lebanese, you know, they, uh, every Lebanese says, uh, yes, you have different languages, we have different confessions, but how, how you manage, you know, to, 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 to build Switzerland, and, and uh, uh, there is no Swiss recipe, don't, don't worry, because I think that's it's foolish, but there, it's a very fertile ground for the exchange of experience. And I, I organize many debates on uh, all kinds of topics, you know, about Swiss institutions, etc. So politically, it's very rich. Culturally, it's, a, it's an extraordinary country because you have the Arabic culture, you have the French culture, you have the Anglo-Saxon culture, you are in different worlds in, in, in one city, which is uh, something uh, quite... And culture here, cult I, I have a special love for culture, for cultural diplomacy, because cultural diplomacy, you know, if you do, I would say, commercial diplomacy or political affairs, you have often a hierarchy. You have countries with power and countries with less power. In culture, you do an exchange between a Malian uh, music group and a Swiss music group. You don't say the group from Mali is more important or, or, or more powerful than the group of Switzerland. You know? Cultural diplomacy really uh, allows exchange. And in this country, culture has a very special meaning. But I was in New York, I did a lot of contemporary culture, but in New York it's entertainment, it's leisure, it's a commerce, business. 
here it's you know you feel that people uh, uh, it's like oxygen for the people you know culture is is a link to the world it's uh, some people call it resistance and so I, I find the cultural work here extremely important Sorry? Resilience. Yeah, resi no, it's something, you know, and, and, and uh, so I would say that uh, 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 it's, it's an extremely interesting country. Now, for example, well, there is a Syrian dimension, which is, uh, which is added. I, I don't, for Lebanon, it's a huge challenge, but for a diplomat, you know, uh, we are in the middle of things here. So I, I would say it's a, it's a privilege to, to, to serve in a country like Lebanon. Because, as I say, it's not only humanitarian, it's not only tension, it's a, and then uh, academic exchanges, you know, universities. And, and it's a, in, in the Arab world, you know, there is, uh, I served in Abu Dhabi, for example. And uh, you have a very different way to, to understand the freedom of, of thinking in this country, the freedom of the press, the freedom, you know, it's a, it's a very, very special country. Thank you. Yes. Uh, thank you so much for this talk. It uh, touched upon so many public relations basics in terms of relationship building. Uh, I'm interested to see how you are prepared as an ambassador to deal with social media, knowing that many ambassadors already around the globe uh, fell victims to this open uh, way of communication and put themselves into trouble when they have to answer sometimes not so, not so much strategically. So how are you prepared for that? And you said that visibility is very important. Uh, as a rule for you as an ambassador. So when, it, when is visibility too much, as it happened in your case uh, with the Switzerland and Sweden? To what extent it is, there is a thin line between, if you cross it, intervention, uh, uh, you are imposing yourself. So it's, a, it's, a delicate, it's a delicate balance. It's a delicate balance. But uh, uh, as far as social media, uh, I went to ask my, my deputy, maybe, my, do, do we have a special training in, in social media in, in Bern or...? Uh? Well, we have some courses that you can visit, this is an hour or so about general ah. rules, how to be, but not more than that. Yes, so uh, 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 we, we started, you know, for, I, I told my, our method was quite simple. We. Every every week we have I had with all I speak of New York we, with all my staff we had a meeting, the commercial section, the cultural section, the political section, and I just asked ask them what would you like to publicize on Facebook, and it was always uh, public information, never personal, and I would say as Switzerland we could talk about, but never mingle in the political affairs of, of the country. It's, you know, for me, Facebook is like uh, uh, the terrace of a cafe, you know. You see me people, you say hello, goodbye, but you don't get into... Uh, uh, so it's, it's a way to, to inform, to first to inform about events, and it's a way to inform about policy. But, uh, for example, we never publish policy issues which are not uh, uh, given by our uh, our foreign ministry, you know, we we are we are very very careful. And uh, for example, I give you an example. Uh, one of my staff, I was not in the office in New York, went to Washington D.C. and she liked the embassy very much. The way and the embassy has a swimming pool, mm -hmm. so she, I don't know, she she wanted to to show as a she's American to show how, so she put a, a post on the Facebook, uh, look how lucky the Swiss diplomats are, or something like that. <laughs> my, my colleague in Washington called me and said, is she crazy? <laughs> I said, why? How can she show diplomats here a swimming pool, you know? <laughs> because this goes really uh, uh, with all the stereotypes of, uh, so you must be careful. Another example, my, uh, 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 my former Spanish colleague here. He became, after once he left, uh, uh, he left Beirut, he became uh, the head of the promotion, uh, institu the promotion agency of Spain. <coughs> and he had a Twitter account. You know. And so once he was in Barcelona, and there were the swimming, the World Swimming Championships in Barcelona, and the Spaniards won a bronze medal or something like that. 
But you know, there are some problems between Spain and Catalonia. So when the Spaniards went up to receive their medal, there were some people in the, the audience uh, whistling, you know, and say, and, and shouting against Spain, etc. So he was so angry that he wrote on this on his Twitter, "Ah, those bloody Catalonians!" And he lost his job the following day. <laughs> so you must, you know, never forget that you are a function. You, you cannot. Uh, you know, uh, I mean, she's, she's raising, I think, an important issue, that is the paradox of the plenty. Sometimes the more you say, the less you're understood. Yeah. I remember in Tripoli there was an ambassador who used to tweet and Facebook and speak on the radio and on television and give interviews right and left and center. And at one point I asked uh, a politician about him. He said, I really don't know what's his position. He talks. Too much. <laughs> <laughs> no, I uh, I tend to agree. You have to be to be a bit specific, but you cannot avoid. You know, if you went because in this promotion job, our target audience are young people. You see, we we, we went to, to 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 develop a relationship with the younger generation, and the younger generation, you know, uh, Facebook, uh, digital media. This is social media. This is the way they, they, they interact. So it would be foolish not to do it, but uh, you have to be careful. And there are some some uh, some risks. And what is very you know security is so important, especially because you have these confidential you know, reports. Like I was telling you about this American ambassador who wrote uh, WikiLeaks did a lot of damage. A lot of damage, you know, to, 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 to the U.S. because the job, you know, our job is to inform our government, you know, and to be frank and to be transparent. But all what you what you write must not be be shown. You know. And then, uh, because of WikiLeaks, everything uh, went public and uh, it became a, a huge, a huge, a huge issue. And uh, build, you know, you, you lose trust very easily. To build trust, it takes, uh, it takes a long time. Yes. Thank you, Ambassador, for your interesting talk. Um, I mean, being the ambassador of Switzerland, um, which is a country with a tradition of neutrality, uh, placed in the heart of Europe, but somehow detached, politically detached from EU institutions. I mean, uh, what is special about uh, being a diplomat, representative of such a special country in the international arena? I, I would say, uh, very in, in two words, uh, Switzerland's vocation in the world is to build bridges. We have this special position, you know, uh, our neutrality, our tradition, the way to be a bit, you know, on march. Um, gives us the opportunity to build bridges. So uh, uh, this is our added value. So my uh, uh, my position would be every time we can build bridges. You know, we you know we are lucky because we don't have uh, we can't talk to anyone. I, I see in this country there are many of my colleagues who cannot talk to some groups, etc. We are able to talk to anyone, and that gives us. A, 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 I would say in some ways a privileged position. But some people also you know, don't understand neutrality because some people say, but how can you be neutral between evil and good? So, so when sometimes they have a, that was especially after the Second World War, uh, we were very much criticized. And, and even sometimes we asked ourselves, you know, it used to be neutral. It, it, it was very useful to be neutral before you know, one century ago when the French and the Germans were fighting each other every 20 years. Now they are all parts of the European Union. They are all friends, part of the same uh, group, and we are out. So we are neutral between whom and whom. So it's much more now a question of, I would say, it's a culture. It's a culture, you know. And, and, and Switzerland, is, uh, what is interesting, what makes Switzerland very special, it's a political culture. It's, uh, we are not a country based on a language, on a religion, but we are a uh, country based on, on a set of, of, of values. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Perez, for your, for your wonderful uh, presentation. Thank you, Dr. Mitri, for inviting me. I really want to read a little bit more specific. You're here at the university, and it's one of the 
quite prestigious university where you have academic freedom, you have a lot of uh, students, faculty members, you have an institute uh, that really discusses in, uh, international affairs. Uh, is this a new role for ambassadors to really focus on, really to interact with academia? This is an opportunity whereby they do not only meet uh, people uh, that uh, sort of formulate the thoughts of the country, but also the new generation, the, the younger generation, the, the, you have a mix of genders. Isn't this some, uh, something of an opportunity for ambassadors to, to focus more specifically on academia? I know in your previous term, you really focused on civil society. And I think this is a good uh, forum or a good platform that one could really build up on as ambassador. No, I feel it's, uh, it's a very, uh, um, very important to focus among other institutions on academia and especially on, uh, uh, I would say, to have a presence. That's why, you know, I, I gave a course. I, I, I thought it was, it was important, but also on academic exchanges. And uh, I take, uh, you know, the opportunity we have just behind you, you have Professor Carbonier from the Graduate Institute of uh, International Studies in Geneva. And he's here as a, as a, as a fellow. And I, I was telling uh, uh, Dr. Tarek Mitri, you know, it would be great to, to really uh, uh, take the opportunity of having Professor Carbonier here to, to start some medium or long-term relationship between AUB and uh, uh, because this is very, very important, you know, and then you can have an exchange of, of students, you can, you know, you can develop in many different ways, and, uh, uh, you know, stu students, foreign students who study, in, in my case, in Switzerland, become, when they come back to their country of origin, they, beca they become our best, uh, the best ambassadors, because if they have had a good experience as students, as, as students in, in Geneva, in Zurich, in Lausanne, uh, often, you know, one of our main, of our first tasks when we come to a country is to build a network of what we call friends of Switzerland, in my case. And often the nucleus of this network of friends of Switzerland is made by former students. Yeah. So, yes, uh, Thank you very much, uh, uh, Ambassador Dr. Mitri. Uh, since you mentioned it indeed, uh, I think it, uh, it's certainly something we will pursue to have a, a partnership agreement between the Graduate Institute in Geneva and EUB. Uh, and uh, as you said, uh, I think uh, for a diplomatic reason it's quite important. We are very glad to have that the Graduate Institute, uh, Kofi Annan, is an alumni because it's well, it's, uh, it's a special relationship, but it brings also interest from students from all over the world, knowing that, well, among our alumni, we have okay. I have one question which relates a bit and builds on the question about the specificity of Switzerland. As a direct democracy, we are called upon to vote on any silly things every now and then. And we had to vote, as you very well remember, a few years ago about an initiative, popular initiative, where people collected signature to say, let's forbid the building of minarets on mosques. And I guess as a diplomat representing Switzerland in very different places, be it in Afghanistan or well, in Kenya, here, etc., I guess that you have to be prepared for both outcomes, be it, uh, it is accepted by the Swiss population, it is, uh, it is uh, refused, Rejected, and in that case, since it was accepted, it has quite an impact, I suppose, on the goodwill and the reputation of Switzerland, especially in, in Muslim countries. I wonder if you could share a bit the, the experience of how this makes it a bit specific in terms of being ready to explain uh, well the, the Swiss system and, and this type of votes where the outcome might be very well, badly perceived, actually. So uh, it was in 2009, maybe, yeah? yeah. Uh, in 2009, and uh, you know, you maybe you know our, our system. We we uh, can have an amendment to the constitution if 100,000 um, signatures are collected, and uh, if actually the proposal is not against our constitution and it's put to the popular vote. In that particular case, I would have said because the idea was to forbid uh, the building of minarets and mosques. People say it was a question of uh, um, 
land, how do you say, building, building uh, rules. I, my, my, my uh, analysis would have been it was a question of freedom of religion because it was a kind of hidden uh, building rules <laughs> question. In fact, people were against, uh, uh, right-wing people were against they call it political Islam, but uh, 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 presence, uh, vis a visual presence of Islam. And I would, you know, if I would have, had be, if it would have been the, the chancery, the federal chancery would decide, I would have said I would not accept because Switzerland guarantees the freedom of religion. But, you know, they decided. Other. So we voted, and the majority of the people voted in favor. It's always, in order to become an amendment to the Constitution, you have to have a double majority, majority of the cantons and majority of, of, of the people. And so we were prepared before we received some, uh, some instruction, you know, in case of acceptance, in case of rejection, it was accepted. So I, I went to see uh, the Mufti and, uh, and the Shia, uh, and you know, I, I arrived at the Mufti, I remember, and there was uh, your, pro, your current Prime Minister, the Tamam Salam. And Tamam Salam has been educated in Switzerland, yeah. and knows Switzerland better than me, <laughs> as well as me. And so I found myself in the very lucky position to have Tamam Salam explaining to the Mufti the Swiss system. So <laughs> I, was, I was extremely, you know, because he, he, he explained, he said, you know, it's not, you know, the system that you have this direct democracy, etc., etc. And finally, you know, it did not, uh, in that particular case, it did not cause uh, a problem. But uh, uh, for me, you know, uh, uh, it, was, um, it was not... Uh, the easiest, uh, the easiest of uh, of things, and we have to to because the Swiss sometimes take decision. Uh, lately, we took uh, in fe last February, we took a decision which really, uh, you know, we are not member of the European Union, but we have bilateral agreements with the European Union, and those bilateral agreements are based on four or on basic freedoms: freedom of circulation of goods freedom of circulation of people, freedom of circulation of services, and uh, uh, the Europe went through a very bad economic crisis. Switzerland was not as bad, so you, lately you have had a lot of uh, great influx of foreigners, of, non, of Europeans into Switzerland. And uh, there was an initiative to limit, instead of having this freedom of uh, of circulation of people to have a system of quotas, and it was accepted. And immediately, it became a huge issue because the European Union, to my um, rightly said, you know, either you accept the system or you don't accept the system. If you don't accept the system, you know, you cannot take advantage. So, for example, there were many, many uh, academic exchanges and scientific exchanges because the, er the Erasmus system it was all all was suspended. The European said. Switzerland. You don't want to go back to, back to the rules. So sometimes, you know, the, uh, uh, our, our votes, our popular votes, uh, run, <coughs> I would say, against our, uh, our interest. Uh, against our interest. One more. Yes. Is it me? Two more. Like to go to? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Hi. Uh, Your Excellency, we came all the way from NDU to attend your lecture, and we're quite happy that we did that. Um, as an international affairs and diplomacy student, I have a quick question. Um, we tend to always see the dichotomy between the foreign policy directives of a country and then the position of the ambassador himself. Yeah. To what extent do you feel, speaking about contemporary challenges, that the role of the ambassador is still relevant in that sense and does not fall subject to the foreign policy directives of the country, rather to the, his own incentive on his views on what the issue should be? No, no, you, you, know, you, you have to abide to the instructions. You have to abide to the instructions uh, because if you receive it. But then, uh, I would say the art of being a good diplomat is the way you present it, the tune you use, the, the, uh, it's, a, it's your human uh, added value. You know, you cannot, you cannot just go against the instruction of your government. 
but sometimes you can make the difference, and often you can make the difference by uh, 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 the way you, you present it. And if you, you know, it happens in some cases that the instruction of your government run against your conscience. So you have had cases where diplomats just resign. They resign. They say, we cannot, uh, uh, you resign. But uh, uh, this is, you know, uh, <laughs> this is the job. The job description, you know, you, you are servants of, 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 of your government. Yes. Mr. Okay, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, Your Excellency, thank you very much for uh, your speech. Um, a very widely debated topic in Lebanese politics currently is the voting law. Yeah. And, uh, Mr. Uh, Ambassador, the Swiss voting law, uh, the Swiss voting law, I mean, may offer Lebanon a very big, maybe, uh, solution to this, apart from the, from the interests of the different uh, political parties in Lebanon. Of course, they say, I mean, what they say in, the, in public is different from what they really, uh, you know, pursue. Yeah. But, I mean, this dual system that uh, you have this uh, uh, mayors and the proports, that uh, you can, the, the, you know, they have the, the, the mayors and the mayors and the proports uh, uh, yeah. So that every canton sends two uh, two representatives to the parliament. No, no, we have no, the, no, we have a bicameral system. Yeah. Like uh, like the US. That means uh, we have twenty six cantons. So in one chamber you have one deputy for how many fifty or for a certain number of people. So, for example, our largest canton, Zurich, has around 25 deputies, and our smallest canton, Appenzell, has two. And then you have the other chamber, where each canton has two representatives. So there is a kind of balance between, you know, uh, the two, the two, the two chambers. And uh, you know, a lot uh, there, are, there has been a lot of discussion in this country I have, about federalism, for example. Some people will tell you that federalism is the, soul, is the end of Lebanon. Other people will tell you that federalism is uh, uh, the solution. And it's endless, it's very interesting. And, uh, yes. Okay. Hello? Yeah. Th thank you, Ambassador, for this uh, very interesting talk. Um, I, I wondered if you'd say a little bit more about the role of parastate actors, uh, and specifically with the rise of ultra-powerful transnationals, and obviously here in the region, parastate actors with quasi-sovereign uh, powers, uh, if that renders even bilateral diplomats, in some sense, necessarily multilateral. Can you, can you repeat, you, know, you speak about these parastatal actors? Yeah, parastate actor. I mean, so ultra-powerful transnational corporations that function yeah. in state-like fashion, yeah. that essentially the various factors, some of which you mentioned, yes, yes. that so uh, make sovereignty more porous yeah, yeah, than so it so once was. And I wondered if you'd say a little bit, if you'd expand a little bit more on the ways in which that might force I can explain, give you an example about uh, um, this. Switzerland has several very, very large corporations. You may think about Nestle, for example. You may think about uh, Novartis. We have the largest uh, mining corporation, Glencore, is, is based in Switzerland. And so uh, often this, uh, this corporation have interests which are much more important and powerful than, than, than uh, the country itself and often we run, sometimes we run into, I would say, uh, uh, into problems with, uh, with this, uh, these companies and we try to really build partnerships. You know, for example, I give you an example about uh, the mining, the, what we call extractive industries. You have 
uh, in Africa, in South America, you have these uh, conglomerates who, uh, which have these huge, huge mines, etc. And uh, they pose, they may pose problems to environment, uh, to human rights, etc. And because they are based in Switzerland, they are Swiss companies. And uh, I know my colleagues in Peru, in Colombia, they are often <laughs> uh, 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 asked, but uh, can you do something uh, against these companies? You know, against, you know, to, to, to change the behavior of these companies. So we, we know their power, but uh, we have started now to talk to them. To talk to them, and our ministry in Bern has, 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 has devised uh, uh, um, a system or a, yeah, a process, I would say, where uh, to engage these companies and to, to, to tell them you are Swiss, you are based in Switzerland, we have a set of rules and values, uh, let's talk about it and you may try to apply them into, and it seems that uh, I have not followed very closely, but uh, uh, we are we are engaging with these companies. Naturally, you know, uh, 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 large com multinational companies are not charity organizations. We have to forget. We have to know about that. So, but uh, it's my, some of my colleagues feel it's better to engage <coughs> rather than just to close to close the doors. You know? And uh, we uh, now you have a new field. I don't know if you called. Uh, uh, um, corporate social responsibility. And, uh, uh, you know, often it's just uh, lip service, you know, but, but sometimes it goes a bit beyond. And, uh, uh, but, it, you know, uh, the rise of these large companies, for example, although uh, uh, very, very large finance institutions, naturally uh, diminish the sovereignty of states, you know, if not annihilate the sovereignty of states. The last question. Um, following up on the democracy topic, in terms of uh, the case of WikiLeaks, for example, which brought some damage to diplomacy or diplomat, the case of Snowden, does that mean that the role of diplomat has become more accountable also towards its people, therefore more democratic on the one hand, which is good, but on the other hand, forcing them to the the idea of the three cigars, three men smoking cigars and fixing the world, making it ever more difficult in terms of negotiations and peace. And if we want to take the example of the Oslo Accords, which were done under total secrecy, and right now the negotiations between the US and Iran in the limelight, sort of D-Day, how many days still down. So media scrutiny is sort of making it ever more difficult for diplomats to, to uh -huh. do their own. Yeah, I would say uh, you often you see a mixture of secrecy and publicity. You need at certain stages, you need real secrecy to be trust, etc. But suddenly if you, if you need to influence your public opinion, you have to go public. So uh, it's a whole uh, technique, you know, of balancing secrecy and, and, and publicity. And WikiLeaks, as I said, has done because you, you need to be sure that your reports are confidential. Otherwise, you know, you, you are, you are um, how do you say, uh, really, you are out. <laughs> because, uh, the poor, the, the poor uh, uh, American ambassador in Mexico, you know, he really had to resign. Because once you lose the trust of the authorities of the country of residence, you cannot you cannot operate. So so I don't think that WikiLeaks uh, did a service to, uh, to to diplomacy. That said, uh, to have uh, a better accountability and uh, uh, to have a better control. And, and I was talking about this. I speak about bilateral diplomacy. This is return on investment because uh, today uh, these embassies, you know think about the cost of not only the diplomats but the embassy, the office, etc. You, you, you have to explain why. It's, and so now there is a whole discussion, we did not talk about it, about is uh, an embassy still useful? 
a resident ambassador. Would it not be better to have rowing ambassadors? The other day I was talking with my British colleague, and, 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 and I don't know if you know the British embassy here. It's in a compound, completely uh, 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 secured. And, and, and so I was telling him, you, you are writing a blog, being very open with the Lebanese, and then you live in this, <laughs> in this fortress. You know? And it's exactly the same thing as Americans. You, know, you, can, you can chat with uh, Secretary Kerry or Secretary Clinton. You know? And if you try to approach an American embassy, you're good luck. Even in Switzerland. So, so there is this discrepancy between openness, you know, and, and the facts, you know. And he was telling me as a good time, he said, you know, I told my authorities, you know, I don't know this embassy, I don't know what it's used, you know. We should have uh, a ship. A ship going from one town to the other in <laughs> Lebanon, open, open to the people and to meet the people. This is a modern modern diplomacy. So so uh, all all you know, the world is changing, but you still need secrecy. You still need you still you still need discretion. You maybe you don't need you know the symbols of power. You know you don't need a, a beautiful embassy. But uh, for example, in New York, you know, I was giving you the example of my residence. I came to the conclusion that in New York, Switzerland needed a house of Switzerland. That means a house, townhouse with. On, on the ground floor, an open space for all kinds of events, open to the, to the street, for young people, for the Swiss community. And then on the first and second floor, the apartment of, of the Consul General. But we don't need uh, uh, any more super uh, uh, luxurious residence. You know? it, does not, it does not need. So we have to be able to, to adapt. We have to be able to adapt. Thank you so much. Thank you.